So my name is Robin Brower. I work at AstraZeneca as a site IT lead, and I'm absolutely thrilled to present here today. And together with me, I have the best data scientists of AstraZeneca with me who are all going to present their particular use case in the drug development process and how we apply AI. This morning, there was... Um, some talk about how important it is to have diversity. So just have a look at these numbers up here. Anything that stands out? Looking at this room, we might have some work to do in this room in, in terms of the gender balance. Something else stands out, 100 data scientists. That's fantastic. Two years ago, it was probably zero and we've Yes, we've rebranded some of our people to now be data scientists. Um, we also have people from 50 countries, uh, 30 professors, 600 really smart people, PhDs. I don't have a PhD, so that makes me a bit less smart, I guess. So, just wanted to give you some context from a business perspective why is AI interesting for us as a company? When we look at the expenditure, the R&D expenditure, um, you can see the challenge of the industry. The costs are, are rising and rising rapidly. 20% of our revenue goes to R&D. And furthermore, if you look at a single approval, drug approval, what have we spent? Today, that's $2.6 billion per approved drug. If you look at the funnel of, of ideas that make it into a, a final drug, very, very few make that. And it takes about 10 to 15 years from idea to a drug. On top of that, only two out of the 10 marketed drugs return the revenue that match or exceed the R&D costs. So that's why we are interested in AI and machine learning. We need to become much better, faster, and cheaper. So how do we do that? And where can we apply AI? So today you'll see a number of use cases across our value chain, and just really, really uh, simplistically, all the way on the left here, this starts out with an ID, a molecule, we go to toxicology, we test it in animals, if there's any side effects, unwanted side effects, if it actually works. And then we go into the clinic, and that's where we test on humans. That's in very short our value chain. And again, you'll see examples across the value chain today. Data, and we're collecting data. Many people spoke about it already today. We're collecting vast amount of data. Here are just some of our examples. Genomics, we're, we're sequencing and, and collecting terabytes and terabytes, even petabytes of data. Um, we're collecting from wearables. We're collecting data. And the list goes on and on. So collecting all that data and managing that data is a real challenge. That's perhaps another conference. But then we have our fantastic data scientists who try to make with algorithms and, and with our high performance computing platforms that we have, try to make some sense out of all of this. And without further ado, I'll hand over the mic to Emma Evertson. And an applaud. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Emma Evertsson. I work as a computational chemist at AstraZeneca. And as a computational chemist, I am a chemist, but I do the experiments and the molecules in the computer. So I will start to describe how we do the early discovery. So we start with some sort of, of protein, a drug target, a protein that we want to interact with to make people healthy. And that target protein, we have 
we normally have some, we have many different ways to find a couple of compounds that we know can interact, inhibit or um, yeah, inhibit that protein to make it more efficient or to make it more efficient. And we start from a set of molecules and then we design some things that we think are a bit more bit better, some molecules. We make those, we have really good chemists who can make them for real, not in the computer. We test them to see if they bind better to the target protein that we're interested in. We look at the data and analyze the data and make a new set of compounds. And that brings us into what we call the DMTA cycle. So we rotate around that cycle over and over again until we find one good compound that fulfill all our criteria. And that is the compound that we then test in humans and hope to become a drug. And that can take, make, we can make maybe a, up to a thousand molecules here, maybe more, and, and before we find the one single good compound that we want to move further. Um, so if we zoom in a bit on the testing part here. So as I said, we, we want to, to test if the molecules we make, if they uh, bind better to the target protein we're interested in. And these, these tests are, of course, specific to each target. And if we want to model these tests, make models to predict the outcome of these tests, we need to do that on limited amount of data from the start of the project. But the more and more we get data, we can make better and better models here. So the quality of the models get better by time. And by the end of the project, we can make often quite good models here. But there are other things. This molecule, they, it doesn't all only need to interact with the target protein. It needs to get to the right place. It needs to go into the body, into the cell. It needs to be soluble. So we have all these properties of a molecule that is not, not only for it's, which is not specific to each project we work with, but it's general to all the projects we work in. And over the years, we have collected here enormous amount of data at AstraZeneca from all our sites. We have maybe thousands, 10,000, 100,000 data points for these molecules that we have measured here. So that means that we can make really good models here because we actually have a lot of information and data. And here we do machine learning models that we can use already from the start of the project all the way through for all different projects. And these, we, these different models we collect in, in what we call C-Lab, which is a set of models. So when this works, it means that we can, make, we can design the compounds, we can test them in the different models, including the C-Lab models, but also the project-specific models, analyze the model data, and only make the ones that we actually can see from the data will be really good. Uh, and in that way, we can make much fewer compounds, and making compounds is actually often the most expensive part of the whole thing. We can do a lot of fewer tests on the compounds we actually make, only the tests that we really think is needed. Um, and this all makes that the time to find the right compound will be reduced, and which is really good. But the important part here is to make the models available to all scientists all over our different AstraZeneca sites at the point of design where they, they make the design of the new compounds. And how we have solved that, John will describe to you. Thank you, Emma. So uh, my name is John Kuma, and I'm a data scientist who works at AstraZeneca on uh, making predictions available to people. So as Emma mentioned, we have many models at AstraZeneca that could be useful to a number of projects, but AstraZeneca is a global enterprise. So how do we make the models available to everyone in a useful way? Well, we do this with, as Emma mentioned, again, a platform called C-Lab, but it starts here with our scientific computing platform. And it's on this platform where our data scientists can use the resources we have available, their favorite uh, platforms and programs, 
in order to actually design, test, and build the models. I'm not going to focus on that part of the process or the models themselves. I'm going to talk more about the platform for delivering the models. But these could be something as simple as a molecular weight or something more advanced, such as a classification or regression algorithm. So on top of the scientific compute platform, we have our private cloud, OpenStack. The advantage of this is we can use the uh, package software tools and all the file systems that exist within the scientific compute platform. And it's here where we deploy the servers that comprise our solution. So very briefly, the models themselves are deployed as microservices within the Netflix Spring Cloud uh, framework, which was a Java project open sourced by Netflix. And it uses the uh, Eureka component to handle model discovery or microservice discovery, and the Edge server to handle load balancing and registry. It also has some uh, basic admin functions in there. So right now, we've got about 50 models in this system. The vision is we're looking to expand to about 2,000 models. So that's going to be a real challenge going ahead. We're also using another open source component, the uh, WSO2 API Manager, and that handles things such as user credentials and throttling if you need that. And it also, importantly, does analytics, which can help us know where in the organization our models are being used and if they are delivering value. So the end result is a set of web services, which can be consumed by applications, so that the chemists can use these models at their point of design in their favorite software. Or if we have advanced users, they can directly consume the REST API. We've got a metadata service that tells everyone what models are available and a GUI for directly interacting as, long, as well as some monitoring systems. So that's our current setup. But I'd like to finally present to you the next version of this, what we're working on now, version two. So as you can see, all I've got here is a blank slide. So um, I'm really hoping there are some people out there in the audience who uh, want to work with us in incorporating things such as containers, serverless architectures, automation, and federated cloud into what we've got now. And uh, if that's you, or you even want to discuss these things, come and see us at the booth, and uh, maybe we can help save some lives together. Okay, um, so now I'm going to hand on to Esben. He's going to show an example of how he's using these models to feed into an uh, advanced, uh, advanced molecule generation system. So, over to you, Esben. So, thank you. My name is uh, Esben, and uh, I came here to Jartenberg uh, a cold November day uh, last year. And why did I come? I came here because I want to find a cure for diseases. And my idea was to use uh, machine learning and AI to uh, create uh, drugs. So let's uh, recap this um, design, make, test, analyze cycle, as, as we already uh, saw here. Um, so. Uh, we start uh, usually by having a, a compound that, that can uh, maybe have a, a biological effect on, on some target. And then we go around the design, make, and test and analyze cycle. And why is this hard? Why does it take uh, four to six weeks and maybe up to three years to actually optimize this, this uh, one compound into what we believe can become the, the, the next drug that can cure disease? And, and one of the reasons is it's a, it's a multi-parameter optimization. This single chemical compound needs to fulfill a lot of criteria. Not only does it, does it need to, to, to cure uh, the disease by binding maybe to a specific target, but we also need to avoid a lot of other effects, toxic effects. We need to get it to, to the right place in the body. And another thing uh, that is also is, is difficult is, is in the design phase. Because of uh, chemical compounds, uh, when you start to, to look into the combinatorics of the atoms, uh, this possible chemical compounds, the number of possible chemical compounds, is astronomical. It's been estimated to be up to uh, 10, 10 to the power of 60. 
and that amounts to the number of hydrogen atoms in 900 suns, so it's a lot. So I'm going to focus a bit on, on the design one, where we have just um, uh, seen a bit on, on how we can use AI on, on the test. Um, so uh, the, 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 the approach is, is uh, actually simple. It is to, to do the compound design using uh, recurrent neural networks. And if we have a molecule, we can turn it into a sequence format. Uh, here we have a molecule. It can be seen as a graph with, with uh, atoms connected by bonds. And we have different atom types, carbon and nitrogen. And, but it can also be written as a sequence format, where we use brackets to show where we have the branching and numbers to, to close the rings. So the colors correspond to, to, to this uh, uh, notation down here. And that opens up a lot of possibilities if we do that. Because suddenly we can use all the recent advances in natural language processing and sequence, uh, sequence uh, analysis and sequence models with neural networks. And, and one of them that has been very successful is recurrent neural networks to, to analyze sequences, but actually also to generate sequences. Uh, because we train the recurrent neural networks to predict the next character. So, so uh, uh, and that we train on uh, known molecules from databases consisting of millions uh, of molecules. And it learns simply the rules of chemistry and it learns the, the, the rules of the, the, the SMILES notation. And after training, we can go in and sample this. Uh, sample it. So we have the begin token and it chooses a carbon atom and we feed that back into it and we sample the next character and so forth and suddenly we, we end up with, with a, with a, with a uh, smile string. I'm going to show you uh, an animation here. Uh, here I show the, the output probabilities of the first step after feeding the, the begin tokens and, and this is the, the logarithmic to the, the probability. And, and then we can, can try and then sample this according to the probabilities we have. And here it actually chooses an oxygen. Uh, the colors are a bit dark here, but this is actually a slightly lighter green than carbon. So it's what's not the most probable choice we, we sampled in this. And, and that gives an oxygen over here. We will build up the structure. And then we feed back this oxygen to the recurrent neural networks. And it remembers what it did. So what is the next thing? It is okay, it will output this equal sign. It says put a double bond there. And we put a double bond. And then we simply can iterate through the recurrent neural network and sample each character at a time. And we are building up the molecular structure. And interestingly enough, it, it, it sometimes it have a lot of, of possibilities and at other times, uh, it's, it's, it tends to get much more focused and seems to be uh, very specific at is, is creating a three fluoromethyl group here. And it remembers to close the rings and also to jump back and close the, the first ring. It actually started uh, much earlier in the generative process. So uh, as Emma showed, we, we use machine learning to read in molecules and predict the properties but using recurrent neural networks, we can now also get molecules out of our models. So if we repeated the process, it would, it would make different choices and the end result would look completely different. So uh, this suddenly enables us to, to make this, uh, to put the parts of this design, make, uh, analyze uh, cycle. We put it into the computer so we have the generative recurrent neural network as the designer, which makes suggestions for molecules. And as it's in the computer, we don't need to worry about at this stage to make them in the laboratory. And we can feed them to, to the C-Lab models and project models that Emma and John uh, talked about. And then for the analysis part, uh, we use uh, reinforcement learning to, to modify the generative RNN to output molecules that have the, the model pro, uh, properties that we want. So there's a job defining the, 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 the reward function here. And this can be run in the computer over and over again. And it will output suggestions for molecules for the real world uh, design, make, test, analyze cycles. And this leads to compounds that have um, improved uh, properties in the models. And it seems like we also need to use less real-world cycles, and we end up saving uh, time. 
Um, so, but it's only one of, of the things is to find the, the, the compound that can act on this disease. We, of course, also need to make sure that this is actually uh, a safe thing to use. And uh, my colleague uh, Johanna will, will, will start to uh, tell you about how we use machine learning and AI to, to that end. Thank you, Espen. So my name is Johanna Sagemark, and I work in AstraZeneca's preclinical safety department. So the aim is to ensure that uh, the compounds that we create, that they are safe and with acceptable side effects. Uh, so drug discovery is a long process. Robin told you that it takes on average 10 years to find a compound that has the right balance between potency to the desired effect and unwanted side effects. Uh, so toxicology and clinical safety are the major reasons for stopping the development of a drug. So it's important for us to identify safety risks as early on as possible so we don't put our efforts in the wrong direction. But it's equally important to try to identify paths to steer away from those risks so we increase the likelihood to succeed. Uh, Human safety risk is also the major reason for drug withdrawals, and they can lead to uh, label warnings or restrictions of use, which of course affects the drug's potential. So that's another reason of working with this. So I will show you an example of how we have used machine learning and AI within drug safety. Uh, at the top here, you see the central dogma of molecular biology. Uh, so all our cells has the same DNA that constitutes our genome. This is transcribed into RNA and translated into proteins. Uh, even though we have the same genome in all our cells, a liver cell is quite different from a muscle cell or a neuron. And that is because different parts of the genome, different genes are being transcribed and translated. And, uh, it's also the case that a drug treatment or a disease affects the gene expression. Uh, so if we want uh, to get a view of the status of a cell or a sample, uh, you could measure the proteins, but they are quite cumbersome to work with. So instead it's possible to measure the RNAs, the gene activities, uh, by utilizing NGS, next generation sequencing. So by applying that, you get a data matrix like this, where you have uh, the gene expression scores uh, for every genes in every sample. So how can we use gene expression data like that to predict toxicity? Uh, we have a collaboration with Roland Grafström and Pekka Kohonen at the Karolinska Institute, and they have developed the predictive toxicogenomics base. They have started this work utilizing a publicly available resource with a lot of gene expression data. So they have cell lines treated with FDA approved drugs. First step in their process was to do a gene set enrichment analysis. Uh, this brings down the dimensionality of the data set from individual genes uh, to more biological functions and activity of those functions. The next step is to apply latent to richlet allocation. Uh, so I will leave the drug discovery process here for a little while and, and look at the fictive example to the right. Here you have three different patients or people and their response to intake of juice, candy, salad and nuts. By applying LDA on a data set like this, you can extract signatures where the first signature here relates to sugar intake and the second to a more healthier diet. So this brings down the dimensionality even further. Uh, so in our case, uh, we have applied LDA on the gene set activity scores. And by doing that, we can extract transcriptional response patterns. So different components uh, that describe the data set. And 14, the 14 top components uh, were selected to define the predictive toxicogenomic space. And they were selected based on their ability to group together drugs of the same functionality and also of their ability to predict toxicity. So we have applied PTGS within AstraZeneca. 
And here is one example. This was a compound that did show a limited cell toxicity signal, but it didn't show any major toxicities in animal studies. So therefore, it was approved to be brought forward into clinic. But there, it immediately gave rise to elevated liver values, so it was stopped. And we went back, because we want to learn from this, of course, so it doesn't happen again. We need to be better at predicting toxicity. Uh, so we tested PTGS on uh, animal data uh, to see if we could identify this toxicity from gene expression data. And indeed, PTGS predicts this compound to induce liver damage. Uh, ranked second worst amongst the 48 training compounds. So this shows that using AI, uh, we can predict human liver injury from animal gene expression data, even though a pathologist couldn't see the toxicity in the animal. And we need to get better and better at predicting toxicity, because uh, the better we get at that, the, the safer medicines we can bring to the patients that need it and improve their quality of life. And the less animal studies we need to use in this process. And we believe that AI is crucial for this. So with that, I will hand over to Jesper, who will tell you a bit about the clinical side. Thank you very much. How are you? Is everybody okay out there? S still awake and alert? So my name is Jesper Havso. Uh, I'm working, uh, me and my co-presenter David Svensson are working on uh, in late stage um, uh, drug development. We're working in, in a new form group data science and AI. And let's take a, a little bit of a jump here then. So, so now we're a few trials down the line. The safety and tolerability profile is more established. And we can start trial, test our drug in, on a larger scale. So in this trial, we usually have thousands of uh, patients and they're either giving uh, active treatment or uh, some standard of care or comparator. And they're on this, drug, this treatment for years or at least several months. And after that, you measure something uh, relating to efficacy and safety of the drug. And if this outcome Y uh, is better for the treated with your drug, than, than for the control arm, then obviously you're happy. So it's really quite simple. Um, but obviously the, the devil is in the details, so there's a lot of complications here, and, and it's not really that simple in the end. And I'm gonna talk about one of the complications, and that's that patients are different, and the disease is different, and this has come through in different um, publications that they have been showing that what we thought was one disease previously might actually be a lot of different related diseases with different causes uh, and, and different factors um, uh, relating to, to how, how the prognosis of the patients are. And people have been starting to characterize groups of diseases and, and how that relates to outcomes. So what does it mean for us then? Well, if the patients are different, we should treat them differently. So we need to start move away from, from the kind of one size fits all uh, and into more personalized uh, treatment and where we can get the optimal treatment for every patient. So get the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. So if we then go back to our trial, so how, how can we find who, rea who reacts best to our medicine in giving this trial? So as I said, there were thousands of patients going into this trial. They are uh, randomly 
give an active or controlled treatment. And before then, we also measure a lot of baseline characteristics. It could be hundreds of, of different variables that we measure. And then if they're on active, we will get a measure on Y1. And if the patient is in, on control, we'll get the measure of Y0. But for no patient, we actually have both these measures. And that's a problem. So we only have kind of partial data. Um, and also, there is a lot of variables that will relate to the outcome on Y1 and Y0, irrespective of what treatment we give them. And that's um, going to be a problem for these methods. Um, but given this, we are going to let the data speak and, and, and design a machine learning method to, to uh, approach the problem. So I will give you an overview of how we can do that. Um, and so this, um, this can be done that, this way. So we can model the reaction in the control group with one model. And then we can apply that model on the ones on in the, in the active group. And we can, in the same way, create a model for the active group and apply it to the control patients. So that way, we actually get one, for each patient, we get two responses. We both get the one for the treatment and for the treatment that it didn't receive. And then as a final step, then we can create our model to to see where the difference is high. And, uh, and also define what variables this model is, uh, is uh, using to do that. So how do we do this? I I'm just going to quickly go over this slide. We work with academic experts, and we work with different models and how uh, develop new ones, and we also need to evaluate this on synthetic data and on historical data so that we know how we can run this without getting false results out. All right, so just to summarize, I think the, uh, machine learning can be um, a a good method to go away from this one size fits all and move towards the best treatment for each patient. So I will now welcome Robin up again to quickly do that. <laughs> so just to uh, wrap up, key takeaway messages, uh, we need to become better, faster, and cheaper. There's a huge unmet medical need. And I hope, and we hope, that we've showed you where we're applying AI and machine learning today. We're doing this today. And as uh, John was, was alluding to, we have a booth outside. So if you want to come and talk, you want to collaborate with us, or you come work for us, um, you know, it's up to you. We take any questions? Uh, no, we don't take any Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions for this talk. Um, uh, again, in between. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Seneca.